computer. All right. Well, this is exciting. You know, I was counting down the weeks um, for our next guest when she agreed to come on. I, she said, oh, she has things to do. And so I'm thinking August, can I live that long uh, as I'm waiting uh, to hear, uh, hear from her? But this day has finally uh, arrived. Uh, Kelly E. Wright is a, uh, is a, I call her ethno-linguist, but I think uh, she calls herself an experimental sociolinguist. And I think I've heard the label raciolinguist as well. Uh, who knew that there was so much stuff with language, with lingual stuff? <laughs> uh, but it is really down my alley, and I'm really so excited to uh, to to welcome her. She's out of uh, is that University of Michigan? University of Michigan. She is a, a PhD candidate, and uh, she's already just uh, you know being called on the, the, um, just across. The country to uh, to expound on the things and the interests uh, that she has. So, without any further ado, on this day, August twenty fifth, two thousand twenty one, uh, the sixty fifth consecutive Wednesday evening, uh, begun on the eve of uh, George Floyd, and sixty five Wednesdays later, here we are still looking at uh, looking at our country through a, a multiplicity of lenses what makes our country, what makes us, us. And, um, and it's just a pleasure to, to, uh, to see you all and to see uh, and to have uh, Kelly E. Wright. So welcome, Kelly. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for your <laughs> patience with my schedule. Oh, <laughs> I'm no. really happy to be here. Something that was very intriguing to me was that I think you self-identified as coming from, I don't wanna say the Ozarks, but coming from hillbilly country in some way? Yeah, yeah, Talk I'm from me. Appalachia. Appalachia, okay. Mm -hmm. So where exactly are you from? So I'm from Knoxville, um, Knoxville, Tennessee. It's the, it's the largest city in Appalachia, which, um, you know, the region uh, um, crosses seven states. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm from the, the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee, East Tennessee. Is your heritage one that um, um, I, I know little about? Um, there was this book written, and of course, it's, I think it's a little controversial about hillbilly. What is it called? Hillbilly something. Oh, hill, um, Elegy, I think. Yeah, it's a terrible book. <laughs> ah, yes, I heard that. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> But, yeah, uh, he's running for a senate or something in uh, North Carolina or West Virginia or one of okay. the states. Okay, it's yeah. definitely a terrible book. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your heritage and how that the confluence of that and the geography you're in uh, come together. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so the the um, so I'm 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 biracial. Um, and the African American um, half of my family is from Appalachia, um, and so my um, my family came into that area um, in the in the mid eighteen hundreds. Um, well, I mean, aside from you know um, being enslaved, right, um, and being brought into that being brought into that area and settling. Um, there after emancipation, um, my, um, uh, another vein of my family came in as indentured servants from Ireland, actually, and, and black Irish people, um, came over, um, they were stonemasons, uh, tradesmen. Um, and so there's a lot of actual, uh, very large stone buildings. Some of the largest stone buildings in the United States at the time in the, um, 1850s and 60s, um, yes. were built in Appalachia. Um, and so, um, <laughs> my, uh, um, that, that side of my family came and settled in, in the region, and, um, and, and sort of met up, um, with the other, uh, half my, my black family who were mostly, um, farmers and domestic workers. 
Um, and so they settled, they settled in the region and, um, and built homes there. And so we can trace our, our lineage back like uh, four or five generations in, in the area. And then um, my, my, my mother's side of the family, they, they were German immigrants. Um, they came to the United States, um, to New England, um, in the 1900s and, um, they settled in middle Tennessee around the Nashville area, um, in that, or they moved, they moved there in the 1950s. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's, and my, my mom and dad <laughs> met in, in, uh, in Knoxville in the eighties. And, and so that's where I was born. Um, and so, yeah, my, my, my parents, uh, um, my, my dad worked in the trades and my mom is a nurse. So, so just a quick detour. Can you tell us anything about black Irish? Um, a little, um, so I don't know ex much about how, um, the, the people that we came from got to Ireland. Um, but I do know that they, um, grew up or that, that the area that we, that we came from, um, has had black people in it for centuries. Um, and so, yeah, it's actually really interesting. Some of the first linguistic work that I did, um, was going through, um, all of these County records, um, and kind of putting together these histories, um, of Ulster, which is this area in Ireland um, that has very deep connections to Appalachia. So what I had was the, um, the letters that settlers from Appalachia sent home to Ireland and Scotland that were preserved in the archives in Ireland and Scotland. So we had like the letters you sent home to grandma Right. So we didn't have the letters that grandma sent back, but right. we had the letters that grandma like kept under her bed. Um, and so this, this like Ulster Scots, which is, you know, so when a lot of people look at Appalachian English and they think like it has, you know, it sounds like old timey. Um, it actually has a lot of these Irish and Scottish um, roots in it. Um, and it, it's actually older forms of English um, that, you know, the, the, English or the British, right, who settled, you know, New England and all these other places had already lost those forms um, in, in their versions of English that were like preserved in the highlands, right? So these people who came over later um, and settled Appalachia had preserved those, those forms of English. So yeah, it's actually very interesting, so, <laughs> if, so, if not incredibly nerdy. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. So I'm assistant, I'm assistant professor of music at Round Pole College. And uh, one of the things I talk about, I teach a course called Black Experience Music. And so in looking at early musics, I look at uh, um, the confluence of African, Scottish, and Irish music and how it expressed itself. And if you un untangle the strands, they're very clear. Looking at uh, music from the Hebrides, mm -hmm. <laughs> music from Ireland, from Wales, and it, uh, those strands are very strong in terms of the personnel and their participation in the slave, you know, in the, in the, the slave industry, um, and in cooking. Yeah. Um, so you you know, so language is kind of the area that, uh, well, that's your that's your uh, expertise. <laughs> but um, when did you first come upon the interest in those in, in that? language as a uh as a complex you mean like as like as a discipline or just as something worth studying <laughs> yeah yeah as a comp um, in terms of the complex of the different cultures or yeah as something yeah. Worth studying and gaining passion for yeah well i mean it's <laughs> it's hard to say because I, I, I grew up with a, with a passion for music and like, and, and like words. I, I kind of have always been like someone who loved poetry and have been a writer of poetry. So it's like a, an appreciation for language and what we can do, like our ability to make meaning is something that's always been a part of my life. Um, but when I started, um, I guess, thinking about language in, in, a, in a larger sense, um, in a systematic way, um, I was uh, doing my, my bachelor's degree 
at Maryville College, which is a, a, a small school in, in Tennessee. And um, I was studying Ghanaian independence. So the, the independence movement in Africa, um, Ghana was the first uh, African nation to declare independence um in 1957 and um it was a pan-african movement right it was supposed to be creating an africa for africans and they did this in english <laughs> in the language of the colonizer um and so i endeavored to understand the connections of nationalism um, and language and, and, you know, how we build community and national identity and all of these things through, through language. And so I went to Ghana and I did field work and interviewed people who were alive and lived through the independence movement in the fifties. Um, and so that, that this, this idea of how, how do we build nation and, and the connection between self and patriotism um, um, and all of that is kind of where I, really became a linguist and started to understand, you know, um, how language and identity really walk hand in hand and, and how language and history are sort of the same project. <laughs> so Kelly, uh, it was many years ago uh, that I was, um, I was the musical director for Benny, Benny King and we went to South Africa. Uh -huh. And uh, I had never been to Africa before, I was 21. And I was, it was a mind blowing, mind altering experience to be in South Africa. It was actually doing apartheid. And uh, it was very interesting. But one of the things was, I did not know how many stereotypes that re was, were residing in me. And then I went there and so many of them exploded. One of the things, uh, you know, I would never forget when I came into the lobby of the hotel, there were two people there and I said, I was raised in Hackensack, New Jersey. And I said, you guys look like you're from Hackensack, right? And it was a certain kinship with being in Africa. As a biracial person from Appalachia in Ghana, Ghana, right? Mm -hmm. Tell me what that was for you. It was such an experience because, you know, I didn't really, like when we went there, I didn't, um, I didn't really know that it was going to quite affect me in the way that it did. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't expect it to feel like a homecoming um, in, in any way, but we toured um, like a, like a fort, like a, like a slave fort. Um, and that, and you know, there like the the storied like door of no return, right? Of the 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 place where you were loaded onto a ship, and for me, it was this moment of recognizing that, like my African heritage was one of survival. That what makes me a non-white person, like what endures in me, is what made it right. <laughs> Has made it literally all the way around the world back to this spot um and so yeah it it really changed it changed a lot of just just kind of coming around to yeah I'm going to carry these stories back I'm going to try to you know really understand like what happened in this land and and how people um you know what what happened that that didn't allow you know the vision that was here the vision in these words like why didn't it happen like what you know to to try and be able to understand it so yeah it was very powerful um experience for me um yeah and especially with like <laughs> you know your your racial identity is at war you know in yourself too um now that you know it, yeah even like centuries removed it's still very powerful yeah and i i think that's i think that's something very important that you said uh, <laughs> i haven't thought about that in a long time <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> is, is, is reconciling humanity in general, but also atrocity, right? And so kind of this, this sense of, um, I mean, we're here talking now out of a sense of recognizing that humanity is one, and at the same time, recognizing that um, the, the strands that make a wonderful lanyard were, were actually, you know, very, very separated. 
and 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 some of those strands were very very much oppressed and and um and reconciling the two was sometimes difficult emotionally yeah. right it's 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 actually easier to do in a scholarly tradition <laughs> but emotionally that's a whole other other thing right um do you end up reflecting and we'll talk more about your work later but do you end up reflecting about those issues sometimes in the middle of your work um like who am i in the middle of this sometimes yes i mean so um in the program that you heard we didn't talk too much about the the, the work on housing that I've done. Um, but that work centered my voice specifically. And so I, um, I speak three dialects. Um, I speak African-American language, uh, standardized American English, and also Southern American English being, you know, where I'm from and who I am and what I do. Um, and those three varieties have very different identity categories. And so in this project, um, I, I do very much <laughs> stop essentially in the middle of this paper and say like, okay, we've been talking about how all of this is happening and like, it's kind of removed from all of it, but I have to like remind you that this is all me. I am one person, like we're describing them very differently, but all this like came out of my body like I am one person with one soul and like one leer like larynx and like this is like how I live every day and I have to choose who I am in every room that I walk into and it's like really hard and I live it every moment of my life okay like let's keep going <laughs> like <No>. and so <laughs> you know like no like in the paper it's like all right just like checking back and so right. it, it, it's actually really it's it, it's very difficult um uh, to really come that close to sort of realizing how, how much negotiation goes into sort of just existing on a daily basis for That's people true. with marginalized identities, you know, and it's something that I think about often, actually, <laughs> we're getting so personal, but it is, but it is, um, you know, when I, when I ask, when, when, when you start to like ask, like, what is privilege? you know, the, this question, um, it is, um, you know, it is, it is, what is life like without having to ask those questions? You know, what is, what is it like to just exist? You know, that, that is like what a privileged life is, is just living <laughs> without yeah. having to ask yourself these questions all, all the time. Um, and so that's, that's part of what, um, you know, my work has pointed towards now is this, this concept that we're, calling sociolinguistic labor, right? right? Of like, there is an energy that is expended um, by people who have to do that, that, that negotiation um, and how do we account for it and measure it and, you know, then you know, care for people, right? Who do that work. You, you know, it's interesting because uh, though I, I rarely go there to visit, I was born in Salisbury, North Carolina. And okay. uh, one of the things that is true, I notice of many people in the South is, if you're in the North, you think of the South with stereotypes. But for many Black folks, like that's home. I mean, that, <laughs> that, you understand that's home, regardless of the stereotypes, you know, and, and for, and it's, it was also a home of KKK. It was a KKK headquarters in the same town, right? Mm -hmm. And so for those folks, it's home. <laughs> right yeah. and so negotiating how in a geographical space you have all of these sociological currents social social currents and it's a really interesting thing and i think language is right at the center of it oh, yeah right because you said did you speak three languages are you responded to differently depending upon which dialect you speak Okay, tell me a little bit about that. <laughs> yeah, so this so this housing study is essentially looking at exactly that. So so what we look at is you call a, a rental a property that's listed, right? A publicly listed property, um, and depending on which voice you use, you get an opportunity to see that property. 
So if I call and I'm using a black voice, they might tell me that it's not available. But if I call using a standard voice, come on down, come and see it today. So doing that in a systematic way over time, right? Um, I, I'm able to measure exactly how that works. Um, looking at it at the zip code level, right? Um, we, tracing it in patterns of, you know, um, median income, right? So if a neighborhood has a particularly like this median income and these demographics, if I use the Southern voice in a white working class neighborhood, I have a 25% higher chance of getting an appointment than if I use a black voice in the white working class neighborhood. So, and this is like me answering the same questions the same way, right? Giving them the same information about myself if they ask it. Um, How did you collect the data? Um, so what I did was I, I made phone calls. I, I called 90 properties um, and I, 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 I made phone calls. I had a, I had a, a question protocol um, we had these predetermined areas that we were going to call and they were based on, um, redlining maps. So redlining, <laughs> um, is, uh, the, so the federal government, um, when we created the home loan system, the system of home loans in the country sent individual auditors to 750 American cities and audited neighborhoods based on what uh who was living in which neighborhood and rated them on a, a four-tiered scale and red was the bottom scale um and so almost all black neighborhoods were put in the red scale um so we use the redlining maps to to look at those to delineate those areas and then compare that to um modern data um, and so, yeah, so I call, I called these properties. I read the protocol, um, asked the same questions in the same order to everybody I talked to. And, and then I measured what kinds of appointments I got um, for which voice in which neighborhood with these given conditions. Um, and so, yeah, and then I took recordings of the, like from the greetings. So just the, hello, like, hello, I'm calling about an apartment I saw advertised, right? Just that those couple seconds from the beginning, um, just of my voice and the different um, uh, dialects. And I sent those off and had, you know, hundreds of people rate them um, based on different attribute characteristics. So these people who are rating them weren't landlords, right? We have that independent data. Um, but then we just get, what do you think about this voice? And they have three very different attitude profiles. So what we find is the African-American voice is the least intelligent, least confident sounding, um, et cetera, et cetera. Across the board, it's the least um, desirable. The Southern voice is in the middle, right? Um, it's, it's less intelligent than the standard voice, but not as le least intelligent as the black voice. Um, it's not as wealthy sounding, but it's not as poor as the black voice. Um, and then the standard voice is the best across, across all three. And then I did some fancy math to kind of compare because those things we might expect to be like interrelated. So for example, you wouldn't expect a voice to sound simultaneously like masculine and feminine. Those like are attributes we expect to be correlated. So we do some math to kind of figure out how they're related. So for example, um, like we look at like trustworthiness um, because landlords said they were listening for trustworthiness. We wanna know how trustworthy someone sounds. Um, and so like a one point decrease in um, like a femininity rating would result in a five point decrease in trustworthiness. So my black voice is just three points lower in femininity than the white voice. But those three points lower are 15 points lower on the trustworthiness scale. So I still sound like a girl, 
<laughs> right? When I'm talking in my black voice, but I'm 15 points less trustworthy sounding in the African-American voice just from that one thing that they're perceiving. So that was a very long way of saying, yes, they absolutely sound very, very different <laughs> to people. And this happens in with two seconds of data, mm. two seconds. Right. So <laughs> let, let's talk a little bit more about the data. Uh, I know that, I think that I heard that the work you're doing now is assembling text and you're doing analysis of text. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's also some previous work. So the text, the, the text um, that started from my master's thesis that um, was about Serena Williams. So um, how that works is I built a corpus about, of 120 athletes. It covers 108 years. So what it is, is all of the journalism that has been printed about in, individual athletes, these 120 people, it's 60 men and 60 women, and it's balanced for race and gender. So there's 30 white women and 30 white men, 30 black women, 30 black men. Um, and what the algorithm does is first, it just counts all the words. So that's the first task. I, I take all that text and I, I feed it to the algorithm. And all I ask it to do is just count the words. So first I get a big old list with every single word that occurs and they're all just counted per athlete. Then I ask it to sort. I ask it to give me two meaningful groups. So it could have sorted on, you could imagine all sorts of meaningful groups, right? It could be decade, it could be sport, it could be gender, it could be anything. I just say, tell me what's most meaningful in this data set. And it sorts by race. So the algorithm says, what is most meaningful in this group of all these words just counted and is race. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, it... that's the big finding, right? Yeah. And how yeah. did how did it do what what the markers would lead it to that? So that's the next step. <laughs> so then the next question is, how do you do this task? Right? How did you sort? And then it gives me a list of importance, essentially. It tells you, here's the words I used to figure this out. And it is not what you think, right? It is it you would you maybe would think like, so, so actually we remove words that you would think would cue you. So a word like black, for example, right? Or a city name, right? Like Jacksonville, right? We get, we get the really, like the things that are gonna cue you in out, right? And we say, do it again. Do you get the same result? And we kind of do that like a whole bunch of times to see if it still points us in the right direction. So we get a word like, Rolex, for example, Rolex only occurs in the white half of this corpus. Although there are white and black players who both have endorsement deals with Rolex, people are only printing stories about those endorsement deals for the white players. Mm. Another word is acquitted. <laughs> <laughs> right? Acquitted only occurs in the black subcorpus, right? Where there are white and black players who have been acquitted of charges. They are only printing stories about black players being acquitted, hmm. right? So this is where we start to see imbalances. There's also another word, right? That words we would expect to be balanced. And that one of those is athletic, right? So these are all world-class athletes, but athletic occurs at a six to one ratio in the black subcorpus to the white subcorpus. So black athletes are being described as athletic much more often than white athletes. And that is like evidence of an age old stereotype, right? So there's like all this, all kinds of evidence, things that would point to what we would expect. 
And then there's just this evidence of what I'm calling like general racialization. So it's not just that different things are different, right? That we describe black people differently than we do white people because blackness is different than whiteness, right? Um, it's that we select from a whole different subset of words to describe black people differently than white people in this instance. In I haven't I haven't tested it in another area, so I can't say, you know, I don't have evidence to back up this happens outside of sport, but I'm sure that it does. <laughs> so let's, let me make sure. Let me make sure. <laughs> let, let me let me make sure your so your data source was uh interviews or reporting. Reporting. Uh, reporting on athletes. individual athletes not teams over 100 years wow very interesting in english yeah yeah in the u.s context i mean we can yeah <laughs> so, so 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 then might uh might an a, a hypothesis be that um that the that the divide profile and current of racism is so strong that we not only use obvious words, but there's a subtext that we use, um, which 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 separates us, a, a subtext of language. I mean, okay, so here's here's I I have I guess a couple of different theories. There's something called a semantic field, right? Semantics is like meaning. You know, we make meaning. Um, you can think of like your mental lexicon, you know, the dictionary that you carry around in your head. Um, and when you think of a thing, when you, you start to describe something, it's kind of like all the relevant words get thrown up at once and you pick the word that you want. So say that you um, are thinking of like a color word, that's like a good example. A lot of times they, they say that this is divide is different between men and women. Like women know, like if I like showed like this color, like men might have like three words for it and women might have like 15, <laughs> right? Like we would throw up like 15 examples and men would have like three, right? That, that's a terrible generalization. But the idea is you, you have fewer competitors, right? Because of your, the, the, your category is um, coarser grained right versus finer grained. I think that that is what is happening in these racialization scenarios. That over time, our exposure to stereotype makes these retrieval patterns in our minds coarser grained. So because we've been exposed over centuries and centuries and centuries before any, any human being on this earth was alive. I mean, this is how far back it goes. We, I mean, literally before the printing press existed, we had been exposed to these stereotypes about race, that these categories were being built about how bodies and identities and categories of humans existed that when we started describing them in texts those selection those buckets of words were just had less words in them <laughs> there are fewer words in those boxes they are coarser grained categories than these finer grained categories that have more nuance in them that we use to describe other groups, other things. There are more things to say, right, about these, the, the majority than there are about the minority. Um, and that, that is what stereotype does, right, is it cordons off the category. It doesn't allow for the nuance, right? Um, and this is like this argument um, that I, that I made in the, in the piece that I wrote for ESPN. So, so I don't know, um, um, oh my gosh, his name just went out of my head. Um, Miles Garrett, Miles Garrett um, hit another player with a, his helmet um, and, and people were calling him a criminal. And so like, this is, I wrote about like, why did we jump to criminal? <laughs> Why wasn't this 
why wasn't this handled within the play of the game, right? Why did this incident get pushed to the law, right? Is because like, we don't have, we didn't have this, you know, this nuance to deal with it because stereotype just told us instantly we're going to this other place. Um, so that's how I think racialization works on this larger scale. Um, and I, yeah, sorry, I'm rambling now. I'm gonna say oh, no, it's, no, this is beautiful. <laughs> this is yeah, beautiful. really, I mean, truly, if you want me to get it, it really, I really do think it is, it is as old as text. Hmm, wow. <laughs> yeah. You know, because I think of, um, I think of when I was younger, um, and if there was someone who, in, you know, in the papers, if, if there was someone who committed a crime and they were black, it would always say a colored man, right? It would it always identify, always, always, you know, uh, if it, it was either a man or a, a, a colored man, if it was a person of color, uh, a black person. Um, and so initially I thought, okay, well, that's obvious, but you, you kind of took out the obvious stuff in your work, in your work, right? You took out colored black or whatever. And so we see there's this, uh, you know, substream, which is, is pretty amazing. Um, how can we grow in terms of, in terms of practical, practical application? How can, and I know you're still doing work and we'll talk about more of that, but you know, when you sit back and you say, wait a minute, this is like, this is some amazing stuff, folks. How do we apply that so that people can see you know, because we don't have the metacognition to, to see that, you know, we do these things. So, you know, have you thought about how do you get that, <laughs> get that word out in terms of the way that we use language? Well, I'm working on it. <laughs> I think part of it is this, you know, I think part of it is, is having conversations like this, exactly like this. Yeah, yeah. Um, so thanks for holding the space. Um, I, too, I think that, yeah, I, I also think part of it is, is that is that like prejudice and bias and these things that separate us are so much bigger than individual choices. You know, I mean, so many people say like, I'm not racist. Like I don't do these things, you know, but realizing that it is something that is so much larger than any one of our, even, even the individual choices we make in our whole lives almost, you know? And so um, that, and that it will take that because it took collective action for us to get where we are, <laughs> right? That it will take collective action for us to right the ship essentially. Um, and yeah, and, and for me, I mean, when people ask me, what do we do? I think, you know, I kind of, it sounds um, maybe a little, a little uh, naive, I suppose, but <laughs> empathy, right? Empathy and kindness to me is the answer to pretty much all of it because I can get pretty hopeless pretty fast, sort of looking around at what's going on in our world. Um, and, but, you know, I think if we, if we can take a little extra time, especially when we're, when we're writing, um, when, when we're writing about others, when we're thinking about how we're engaging with other people, especially when they're, um, you know, very diametrically opposed to how our, we're seeing our, the world, um, especially the more I sort of learn about perception, the more I understand that, like, a different worldview is actually exactly that. Like you do not experience the world in the same way that I do. <laughs> and so I have to understand that you are not coming at this. You're, you are reading a different story, <laughs> right? And so I think being empathetic and also just starting from a place of kindness, which is something I have to remind myself all day, <laughs> right? So, um, so it's not always easy. It's not always easy when people are like actively hating you. <laughs> so you are you are talking my language, and uh, you know you're like a sister from another mister, uh, <laughs> and so I be liking what you be saying. <laughs> so to I be liking what you be saying. Let's talk a little bit about uh, about Black English. Um, 
many times we look at slang or look at a local patois and we and we look at a slang and we see it as some sort of remnant lingual stream but is it not true that you know one can really do some digging and find that there's some really strong linguistic threads in uh in, in even in even in the 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 the, the language of quote unquote hillbillies right you know in, in these areas that have these very concentrated um you know patois that are are less affected from the outside dynamism is is it not true that we can find some really strong uh streams in? i'm talking too much talk to me so i um okay i'm the person who's going to say all usage is valid right which will make basically every linguist man in some in some way um because um the the definitions that separate varieties of language are are all top down they're all institutional right they're all coming from these places that have nothing to do with how people are expressing themselves right um they have nothing to do with the histories of communication um, and so the difference between like a patois and a Creole and, you know, all this other stuff that that's, it's, that's like disciplinary, you know? Um, and so, you know, the difference between a dialect and a language, there's, there's like an old, um, like a saying that says the, the difference between a dialect, um, a, or, a, um, a, a language is a dialect with an army and a Navy. <laughs> right that that it is about support and recognition and and it's it's what you print your laws in that makes it a language right um it's it's that it's taught in school it's that you could walk into a hospital right and say it um and so and so the idea that is there is there something you know retrievable or interesting or whatever in these in these languages these varieties that are used that we might not see in a book or whatever I think they're even more interesting. You know, I say that the, these varieties that we call standard are the ones that aren't real, <laughs> right? But the ones that, and then this is what I say is standard language is learned, right? No one is born speaking standard English. You go to school and you learn standard English. People teach you English. People, you have grammar class, right? You get language arts, you learn it, right? people learn how to write or they don't. They say they hate it for all these reasons, right? Because it's not natural, right? We learn it as a skill. Um, and so, you know, you don't have to learn how to communicate in the same way. It's acquired, it's it's part of our biology. We are, and, and we, you know, as a species, right? We evolved this ability to communicate um, and we actually went through a, fantastic transformation to become communicators. I mean, most people actually do not realize, like we think, you know, you think about like that, um, you know, the t-shirt with like the monkey to the, like this, the guy, right? <laughs> with like all the stages from like standing up, like being on your knuckles to like being like a dude, right? Like <laughs> that is one of the most fantastic things that's ever happened in nature. And that happened because we wanted to talk. We wanted to talk. <laughs> we didn't become forward-facing, bipedal, in, it, like individuals without the will to speak, because we had to completely reorganize our organs. Our lungs went from like a 50-50, like ingress, egress, like breathing in, breathing out, to 90-10. I can take in all of the air in my lungs with 10% of the force that it takes and 90% to breathe out. So I can talk 90% of the time that it takes to breathe in 10%, right? Mm. Um, our larynx, our, our mouths, we separated the, you know, the esophagus from the air stream, like right? all this, right? It all completely reoriented. We have a, an articulable tongue, all of this, all of this happened because we wanted to communicate. And in between that time, from when we were walking on our knuckles, to when we were standing upright, we developed sign language. So we were, we were thinking, we were thinkers this whole time. We were 
we had cognition, right? We had ideas this whole time. We were building society this whole time, right? And all we wanted to do was get the thoughts out. We were just working to externalize thought, right? That, whatever that was, that is the purest form of language, right? We will never know what that was like because brains don't fossilize, right? So whatever we have records of, like that is like the tiniest sliver of what language is. Like there's so much more that we will never know about. <laughs> right that like recordings we only have like 150 years <laughs> you mm -hmm. know it's like a blink right um and so yeah it's like it, it that's what's so fascinating and when people say like language is what separates us from the animals it's really our history because lots of species communicate right but we figured out how to preserve our thoughts, preserve our externalized thoughts in such a way that we could pass them along, that we could save them, All right? So you see like the cave paintings, you know, that like we started to mark property and we started to tell stories about like, this is what hunting looks like. You know, this is what farming looks like. Um, that right there was what, really started to set us apart when we were like learn this is how we do things this is where the river is you know like <laughs> that literally was like that's what kept us alive um that's how we got here to like on zoom <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah no i, I love, it. I love could, it could i could i just say something and i'm taking a risk to, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. say something like this with Kelly, you the expert here, but- Oh my gosh, it's never a risk. <laughs> I, wish, I wish I had saved the article, but just in the last week, I read an article. I'm thinking, believe it or not, it was in Christian Century, reviewing a, a research article or book saying that, now here my language is gonna fail me, but the linguistic consistencies, um, rules, parameters of, Black English are as legion as standard or white English. Mm -hmm. And some, some of them, obviously, you know this, some of them go back to, you know, linguistic traditions of West, West Africa, but not that many. But the, you know, the rules are, are as many. I, I, I don't know. Help, help me out here. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Can no, you absolutely. translate for me? <laughs> yeah. So African American English like is as rule governed as any other language. Like so it's difficult to think of African American English as a separate language for a lot of reasons, right? Because we share so much of our lexicon, right? But the but we like the way that we think of German as another language from English African-American English is the same. Like it's its own language. It has its own structure, its own rules, its own vocabulary and its own social history, right? That makes it its own thing. Um, and so, yeah, and, and you really like, although people do, right? And so it's hard for me to say you can't compare languages by like complexity or structure because people do. So it's hard for me to put a can't there because it happens, right? Um, you really can't compare languages based on complexity or structure because if the only thing that matters is that people convey an idea, right? So that if I have a thought in my head, right, and I flap bits of meat around, be they these bits of meat, right, <laughs> or bits of meat in my face, and I get that idea from my brain into your brain, that is successful communication. That is like the only thing that matters, right? As far as like language being successful counts, right? So if if it does that, it works. <laughs> and that's like all that matters for, for like syntax or whatever to be successful. Um, so when we think of um, like African-American language or Appalachian English um, or like Louisiana Creole, um, or like the varieties they speak in like Newfoundland, right? Um, or like Australian English being its own thing, right? All of that, all of that kind of comes together in, in this way. 
um, where, yeah, they're all systematic, they're all rule governed, and they all have their own histories. And that's really what makes them different is they all have their own social history. And like German and English actually aren't that different. You know, like we think that they seem that different because their spellings are different, right? Because their sounds are very different. But when you look at their social histories, they're actually closer um, than African American English and English English are. So yeah, it's it's very fascinating. Um, and yeah, so you did you did perfect, <laughs> Susan. So, so what happens? Then? Nice of you. Thank you. <laughs> so, so so what happens when you go to the get in the realm of the scholarly tradition. So you have black English and you have a literary tradition. So you are dealing with expectations of standard English, but you're also venerating black language. And there must be this place. I mean, I would love to ask James Baldwin about it. There must be this place where it, it gets touchy as to what are we celebrating here? You know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm sure the Harlem Renaissance guys, you know, the, the poets, they were, they were looking at, at these issues of, and black theater as well, when they were venerating the language, but many times doing it in a way that was um, acceding to the, to, to the, the scholarly tradition of theater or of literature or whatever, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. if I'm if I'm if I'm writing and I want to uh, as a musician, for instance, uh, you know, one of the things that I'm looking at is uh, if I'm like Thelonious Monk and I'm deconstructing things, how to make you know, how to make it something which is called, here we go, art. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, and I mean, Baldwin talks about this. <laughs> um, in, uh, you know, evidence of things not seen. Um, it, it's, um, you know, it's, it's interesting so, because, oh, go ahead. Well, well, because when you talk about communication, you speak about in practical terms, that whatever allows us to communicate is a valid structure. But when we start to put it in the museum, as it were, then it has other kinds of expectations and yeah. those expectations could be good or not <laughs> right yeah so it's like yeah so Bowen says like it's a very grave matter to imitate a people for whom you know you don't exist right um and so so okay <laughs> i think about this i guess it's hard for me to think about like my departure point here um it was illegal to teach black people how to read in the united states so and the u.s is actually the only country that has ever had laws that restricted their own citizens in this way so there are other countries that had like citizens you know of like other nations that they were controlling right but this is the, the only country that restricted their, their own people in this way. Um, so for 300 years, it was legal for black people to participate in knowledge creation, <laughs> right? Um, or, or, you know, to, to read, to learn, to write. Um, and so that to me, I think speaks to the power, right? To this known power of this communicative and creative and self-determinative enterprise, right? That is the written word, right? And and like like you said, like the artistic part of it, right? It's like the the full um, realization of like creative expression. Um, and so stepping into that space, right? With the like the full freedom of being able to step into that creative space, I think is very important and liberatory right and i think when we look at like lorraine hansberry um we see like the full circle fulfillment of what that looks like um <laughs> but at the same time i think about that quote from baldwin all the time right 
of like, it is a very grave matter, <laughs> you know, um, to be forced to imitate a people for whom you do not exist, <laughs> right? Of like, um, that our language, the African American language, has never been given the full freedom of expression, right? That standard language has been afforded. And so, I, I feel like I have not seen African American language opened up in the in those spaces in that way, right? So and and well and so we can look at like rap. I was going to talk about that, <laughs> right? Um, and 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 other places, right? We can look at other places, like and I would say something like the dozens, mm -hmm. um, right? Which is like 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 games like ritual games um you know your, your mama jokes right like other <laughs> stuff um that that this has happened this doesn't happen in uh, the public sphere but it happens in the cultural space yeah. um where i feel like the full flexibility of the language is on display right where we have seen that full like the blossom right um that's that's where I think it has come the closest, but but again, it's it's the oral tradition, um, and so that that and that I when I sorry I'm like so all over the place, but to me when I get when I say is that enough? Like I ask myself like is this enough? I come back to the answer of yes because I don't I think that these these mediums that we want to say this is the height of good or great or the fullness of expression or whatever. It's like, those are your mediums. These are the mediums that Western models tell us are the best, right? Of like lesbians or whatever, right? Or like <laughs> all the good, right? And so it's like the, the ephemeralness of the oral tradition, I think is like where meaning is made in the African-American tradition and therefore, it's it's where we've chosen to see our highest form of creation. You know, um, so so much of this is is actually uh, <clears throat> an expose of power, uh, because when I think about um, let's talk about appropriation. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's what I'm working on now. <laughs> are you okay? <laughs> what, what, what are you doing? Well, um, <laughs> part of what I'm doing. No, what were you going to say? I want to hear what you were going to say. Well, as a person who teaches a chronology of, of Black music uh, and then its appropriation as American musical pop popular culture, decade by decade by decade, oh, 300 years. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's it's there um, when, uh, you know, I remember um, I remember the appearance of rap. I remember what it was thought of as and what it was spoken of as and written of as. And I hear it as part now of the normal, regular, popular lexicon, right? Yep. And, and not only that, but there's a normalization of it that during the Olympics, there were uh, two uh, fairly popular iconic figures, Kevin Hart and Snoop Dogg. And they did their own, um, uh, they did their own narrative of the Olympics and it's gotten like millions of views on YouTube, but they actually spoke like they spoke, you yeah. know, and, you know, folks want them now for the winter Olympics, you know, and there was a time when that language was considered a very otherly, but now it's, it's very much, you're hearing it in every mm -hmm. space, right? So yeah, tell me anything about appropriation. You're the expert. Yeah, I think it's, so it's really interesting. You know how I, I said all oh, usage is valid um, before, um, and I, I will stand by that. It doesn't mean that all usage is appropriate, <laughs> right? Um, it doesn't mean that all usage is free from harm. Um, but I think that there's something really different about appropriation in that it's very, it's very, it's very, um, it's difficult to um, assign ownership to language. Although it's something we feel like we do all the time. And part of that is because 
it issues from our body, right? And so we feel like it is ours. <laughs> um, meaning is made in the listener, right? And so ownership of language ends as soon as it is done issuing from you, right? Um, so that's hard to get past <laughs> for a lot of people. Um, appropriation is, is a tough one because Part of what I'm studying now is, um, I'm, and I'm, I've, I've just concluded a series of interviews with Black professionals about their experiences um, feeling like they must shift away from their African American varieties in their professional lives, that they use a more standard variety in their workplace. Um, and I'm, and what's great is I'm getting lots of different experiences across the lifespan. So older people feel like they don't have to do that anymore, which is really cool. Um, but, um, I'm playing them lots of different examples of black language. Um, and there's this kind of space where they say, oh, that's just like young people, or that's like internet language you know and so some people will say this is black language all the way across all the examples and some people are just like those are just kids you know um but what's different about it what where we kind of know that this um language has been appropriated is that people can use it without consequence without like social consequence so this idea that like snoop dogg you know, he used to be able, he used to not be able to sound like that everywhere. And now he can do whatever he wants. Part of it is because he's older now. <laughs> um, and part of it is because his speech is more accepted than it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, but other people using those terms, those terms that are much more common, um, can just use them and then don't have to worry about being stigmatized for their variety elsewhere right in their lives um they can use those words with friends and then go have a job and a life and not have to worry about not getting an apartment and all this other stuff we've been talking about right um and so and, and we see this happen with all other types of language that have to do with different identities right like um like like gay sounding speech you know um when you say things like, uh, oh, like you're fierce or, you know, people used to do like the three snaps or whatever. It's like you could do that and then go home and not be made fun of for being queer. You know, it's like you could lean into a queer type of expression and then not be worried about being thrown out of your home by your parents or like never this, that or the other thing or being like, right. And so it's like we do these things where we can appropriate a behavior, but know that we're not taking on this identity right that it's not something we have to go home with there's like chris rock you know like he used to do that stand up where he would be like i'm a millionaire you know like all the, like who wants to change places with me and like nobody would say anything and he'd be like yeah because you don't want to be black <laughs> right it's like that it's like you know that you're not going to step into my identity and so like that's the appropriation part is like people know when they're taking something that doesn't belong to them right and it's because they they know that they can take on part of the cultural cachet that comes along with it without having to take the actual identity right and so like yeah it's part of knowing that there is like there's a package <laughs> um yeah so it's, and, it's, it's fascinating and there's also a, there's a power dynamic um uh, <clears throat> uh, but in the in the popular sphere you have to watch you have to see where the vanguard is what i mean by the vanguard um there was a minute uh, where there was, you know, white popular vernacular vanguard, say in the rock era, 1960s, 70s. Mm -hmm. um, but so often the vernacular vanguard happens in the African American sphere. Yeah. And it becomes part of, and, and we're, we're saying these things every day. And if you're old enough, you remember when, you know, it was bad, bad language. And I don't mean that in terms of quote unquote bad words but it was indicative of your very first uh, uh, research that you talked about. 
there are those certain words that you say, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and dances in terms of choreometrics, you know, the, the dances and certain kinds of movements, right? Even the use of the hips and all of that, that's a whole other issue. Um, I want to uh, just do a detour here and uh, I can talk to you for hours, I love it. Um, I want to offer you, and if you haven't done so, a challenge in terms of your work. And tell me if I'm wrong. Mo the majority of your work is text oriented, correct? Uh, no, not necessarily. Okay, okay. Well, then let me go on and and, and assume that uh, it was. Okay. Because I I did hear you in an interview where you um, where the research you were doing the person was fascinated because it was text oriented. Mm -hmm. I offer to you that the music in the text is as potent as the words themselves. Oh, sure. Right. And so in doing, um, in doing work, if you say, mm-hmm, 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 right. Mm -hmm. That they all mean different things and come from different places. It's yeah. different music or in academic circles a few years ago was the appearance of of having everything on the up like I went downtown and and it's, it's in Ridgewood and we're going to um, Ridgewood Avenue and it's on Main Street you know you heard all this this you know and people and yeah and yeah and people were like what the heck is this? what are they doing right mm -hmm. um and then there are other kinds of music which are you know I'm not going to do that <laughs> you know and so there's all these these um, um uh, musical moments which are actual cultural music because we're oh, all yeah. our cultures do things as well. And they bear research. I've never seen research in those kinds of things. Have you, it, does it exist? It does, yes. Ah. Oh my gosh, there are people doing research on this and it's pretty cool. So there's a woman, her name is Nicole Holliday. She's a professor at Penn, um, a professor of linguistics at Penn. She's, she does a lot of work on this. It's um, in linguistics, we call it prosody. Um, but it's, you know, tone, um, and, uh, we've got some software that can kind of track the, the tone and, uh, she's, she study, she studies politicians. She looks at, uh, Barack Obama and, 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 uh, Michelle and Kamala and, and other people and looks at how their tones have changed over time and in different situations and in different conversations with different, um, communities. Um, she's also studied uh, different groups of people, not politicians, um, looking at how um, biracial individuals um, shift their tone based on people of different races they're talking to and also based on topic. So um, she, she gives them interviews and, and asks them specific questions about interactions with the police and looks at how their tone changes when they talk about the police. But there is like an entire field of linguistics that is just dedicated to studying prosody. So there's like <laughs> a whole field of linguists who does only this. Um, I am studying, I, I have incorporated some prosody into my dissertation. Um, I'm looking at news speak. So I, I told you I'm studying professions. So one of the professions I'm studying is a newscaster. So I don't know if you've seen um, the, um, the woman who's like really famous on TikTok for doing the black newscaster voice, um, but uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll send you a link <laughs> um, so you can Please. share it with the group. Yes. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's really, it's very fascinating and um, it's, it's really its own thing. You know, the, the new news speak, right, is really its own thing. So it's, it's uh, you know, uh, Good evening tonight on you know like whatever right it's like, <laughs> right right so it's 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 really fascinating um, so so yeah, combined yeah. combined with that is that I'm not trying to take too much time but like I do workshops different places Guam France Poland different places and one of the things I do is work with music groups choirs and many times their use of their body whether they will just use the high part and they only sing an yellow sound very nasally and the whole country sounds nasally right when they're singing 
And then other places there, it's very chesty and they use the glottal and they use their full voice. And it's very cultural. You can go culture yeah. to culture, mm-hmm. you know, and there's an ethnomusicologist named Alan Lomax who did work in this area um, um, called the uh, Global Jukebox. Um, it's fascinating how we make decisions as to the music uh, of our language, but I'm going to find Nicole Holiday for sure. <laughs> yeah. So what is the work? Um, is that your latest work, the work on newscasters? Um, yeah. So the work I'm doing now is, is this work on professionalism. I mean, I, I'm, I'm interested in the concept of professionalism in general, um, you know, very much in the way I was working on nationalism in general before I'm, I'm working on professionalism in general now. Um, it, it's, it's very dissertation-y, which means it's like not interesting <laughs> um, in that. I, I'm kind of trying to to test a, a sort of several different very field internal theories. Um, there there is this this idea, and this kind of goes back to what we were talking about with appropriation. That in that it works in both directions, right? So it's not just this idea that you know, like like white people borrowing black language to sound cool, right? Which is like happened forever um, or other minority language, right? It's like not just, it's, and we call this like bottom up influence, right? Um, but, it, but it works in this other way of that, like when black people use standard varieties in professional settings to avoid stereotypes, they don't quite avoid them all right? You still have to be Black, right? And so there's this idea called ratio-linguistic ideologies. And what it says is that people who exist in a minoritized body from one way or another or have a minoritized identity, so maybe your body itself isn't minoritized, right? Um, But you might be like disabled or, or, you know, not visibly disabled, right? Um, that your language practice is always already downgraded, right? So it doesn't actually matter what falls out of your mouth, right? Or hands, right? (laughs) Because I don't want to make it just speech centric, right? It doesn't actually matter what language you produce, um, which like rejects basically all linguistic theory beforehand, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't actually matter what you produce, um that because of who you are your embodied experience that influences how people perceive you um and so your actual performance doesn't really matter so that is what i'm testing i am trying to find out if performance actually matters um and so i've been interviewing people about their experiences so i have this whole big ethnographic project which i have just completed and i'm about to start doing this experimental sociolinguistic work um, trying to find out how people respond to these voices um, that are people using their normal voice, their normal speaking African American voice, um, and then a professional voice in the standard variety, and then also the like very stylized professional voice of like the newscaster doing the whole performance of newscaster. Um, and I'm also doing a city council member. So doing like a politician on a, you know, um, soapboxy. So it's like normal speaking voice, standard speaking voice, and then like performing all the way, right, voice. Um, So we've got those three conditions. So we're going to see, like, does it matter? Like, are they rated the same no matter what they do, right? And how how do we see these different categories playing out with the, the same speaker, um, and what I'm, and, and I'll, and, you know, maybe I'll return to you now that I've told yes. you all, none of you can, absolutely, but none of you can participate now that you know what I'm doing, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm trying to get the most general sample possible because almost all university studies are just university students. They're 18 mm. to 24 year olds and they're just yeah. kids who go to college which are like a very privileged set of people in the U.S. like so many people don't go to college even though we think like everybody does right mm-hmm. and so I'm trying to get the general population to do this study and so, so I just so, want regular people to take so the, no, so the null hypothesis <laughs> the null hypothesis is that no one will be affected but I imagine that your supposition is that someone that that we will be affected I I honest I mean yeah I mean I, I honestly expect there to be a difference. I think that this, you know, the strong racial linguistic theory is a little too strong that 
I would like to believe that centuries of people who have been trying to perform standard language to not to avoid stereotypes haven't all been doing it for no reason, <laughs> you know, that it hasn't all been for naught. But I mean, again, there reach back as far as you want to in black critical theory. And there have been people who have been telling us that that was not worth it. <laughs> so, mm. so, you know, it will be very difficult to, to prove um, that that's what we're finding if that's what we're finding. But I can't, I can't put people in the lab because the lab is closed still. So, so this will be as close as I can get at this stage of my career. You guys, so let, I'm so sorry. <laughs> the no, pandemic let, kind of ruined things for me. No, that, let, <laughs> let, let me let me throw this. I'm just gonna throw this softball to you. Um because everyone gets asked this question, and it really gets asked this question because it's been a, I think a political maneuver to make it a big topic. But does critical race theory mean anything to you? What is it? What what comes to your mind? Um for, for me and my discipline, it doesn't apply too much. Mm -hmm. um, I really think about it in its original legal form yes. in that, you know, it's um, the legal theory really didn't apply race and, and, and to think about how to, to, to make the law equitable, there needed to be critique right um, of, of the structure of legal theory in such a way that applied a racial lens. Um, and so, yeah, it just like all other critical theory, right. It's not really, um, that different from other critical theory, That's right. That's right. um, in my opinion, but I mean, it is a very useful tool and I have, I, I have, a, I did apply it, um, in, in some regards in that housing work because of all of the redlining research that I did was very legally based. Um, and, you know, part of the reason I did that work is because dialect discrimination is legal in this country. Um, it's, uh, you know, even though, yeah, discrimination on the basis of voice, you, you can't win a case based on that. So. By the way, when you were doing that work, had the color of law come out yet? Um, yes, uh, it, it came out in the same year that I was finishing that work. Oh, okay. Okay. Because yeah. it's, yeah. it's a very interesting book. It's a good book. It's right there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was just eye opening. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you will be hopefully uh, finished with your course. Are you finished with coursework? I am. I have five. I have five months to go. Oh, OK. Yeah. All right. OK. So that, I'm almost done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is your hope? And obviously, when you're in the middle of this, your only hope is to get through is obviously, but, you know, in certain moments, relaxed moments, you look beyond and what would you like, where would you like your work to take you? Such a question. At this point, I am truly just hoping for a job. I would, I would like to be a professor. <laughs> um, truly, I mean, it, it's, it's hard to say, honestly, um, with the the, the future is bleak <laughs> um, for, for academics at this time. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I, I, I would love the opportunity to teach. I, I love being in the classroom. Um, I, I love doing things like this. Yeah, as you said, I've kind of, I've, I've been bouncing around and, and having conversations like these. And, and this is what I really enjoy is just talking to people about language. Um, and I really want to continue doing that. Um, so yeah, I, um, but, I, but I would love, you know, eventually in the future, um, to be working on the kinds of specific policy issues. Um, so, well, we're, yeah. we're, cert we're certainly going to put certainly going to put your name in uh, uh, certain academic spaces and let folks know that you are alive. Oh, I'm hireable. Um, I'm okay. yeah. I got a CV ready. Anyone wants to see it? <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, are there any questions from anyone? Is there anyone who has a question? I, I do have a question and the, the housing study that um, it's complete. Is it, is it complete? Is yeah. the first, okay. And, um, and is it available uh, to, uh, or, and what, like, what, what are you doing with it? I guess. Is sort of yeah, the it's, it is, um, it's available in various forms. Um, I, it, it is like days away from being submitted for publication in like an academic form, but I have like a hundred page version if like an individual would like to read it in that form. And I also have um, some videos on my YouTube channel of me like presenting the work. Um, so 
it's, it's consumable in a couple of different forms. Um, and yeah, I, I, once I finish, I'll be writing a book, um, mm-hmm. about it, but it'll, you know, that's a couple of years out. Um, but yeah, a publication, an academic journal publication is, is soon to be submitted, um, and will probably come out within the year. Okay. I just, I mean, I, I asked just, you know, even with, within our school district, when, when the teachers are talking about redlining and I mean, this to me oh, yeah. would be a fascinating, um, you know, piece for the students, you know, to learn. We have a pretty progressive history department in our high school, even though there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Um, yeah. But I, I, I hands down, no doubt, um, know at least four teachers that would be intrigued, you know, to be able to get their hands on this. I, yeah, I've got it in a couple different forms, um, including like, in an older presentation, but it's just five minutes. So, um, you know, it might be, yeah, I'd be, if you want to email me, I'd I'd send you what I've got. I would love that. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be great. Put my contact stuff in the chat. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Is there another question? Yeah, this is, uh, this has been really good. And of course, as soon as we say goodbye, then I'm going to have three more questions. Right? Well, that's okay. <laughs> Unfindable. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll stay, uh, stay in touch. Um, I'm hoping that um, as I look at other countries, and uh, I'm in communication with different countries, and I hear Americanisms, all over the place. I hear Americanisms that derive from music, but also just derive from movies and, and what have you. And I always, I often wonder, um, you know, there is a lament in certain circles of this country that our culture is going to hell. We're going downhill, our culture, you know, whatever that totem is. Um, but I was wondering what you think about that in terms of looking at uh, looking at currents, both in the United States, but in the world. Are there any things that you, you see that can be informed by your understanding of linguistics? I don't know, I mean. And if you don't, everyone, it's okay, but you know, well, it's, some people- Every once in a while, somebody pops into my inbox, right? And they're like, people are using this word in this new terrible way you know, like what's wrong with the kids today, you know? And I'm like, I, you, you've so asked the wrong person, like, here's a rant about why you're wrong. Do you still want me to write? A, do you still want me to talk about this? Um, <laughs> is that like language change is continuous and ongoing, right? It's natural system. So it's, it's an evolution, right? Which means it is like continuously evolving. Um, and, 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 our language changes as our society changes. Um, and I use, I use the example um, of, of the word cock, which used to mean rooster, which it was like male chicken, right? And we have the word rooster now in our language because all of a sudden it was improper to say this thing that now meant male genitalia because Victorians were like, oh, don't talk about the body, right? And so, <laughs> All, we had to make up a word. We, we made up the word rooster. It doesn't have, it, it, its etymological root is we made it up because we didn't want to talk about the body, <laughs> right? And so like this, this idea of like, we just pull things out of the air, <laughs> right? Like as the society changes, as like things get invented anew, that's like when they say like our culture is devolving, it, that it isn't possible, right? This, this systems don't work backwards. <laughs> right they, they just don't you can't it's like a black hole right you can't come out once you go back in there's an event horizon <laughs> so, so in your la- in your last mu- uh, last uh last minutes i'm going to lob you a grenade <laughs> and uh you can throw it back through the screen if you want tell me what you think about the word nigger oh awesome thank you so much um this is a question in my dissertation interviews so I'm gonna have like many people's opinions about it. I think that um, there are th- it's three words. There, there are three versions. Um, there is one that is a slur, right? That was listed on ship manifests in the same way that you have like head of cattle, right? Um, 
that it's entirely dehumanizing and no one should ever say it. And I don't say it. I don't feel like I have the right to say this word. Um, there's this, there's a second version that ends in A or AH, um, which I also don't feel like I have the right to say. Um, that is a term of endearment, right? That is used among the black community as a recognition of hello, right? Hey man, hey person, right? Or, you know, like, look at this person or this man was over here doing this, right? Um, it's just a normal word, right? Um, I don't feel like I have ownership to say it because I don't know, I didn't grow up saying it. I didn't spend enough time in the black community when I was younger, it's never been part of my daily vocabulary. Um, although I know other mixed race people who have no problem saying it. Um, do I sing along the songs and say it? Sure. Right. Has it come out of my mouth? Yes. Um, and it's not a slur. So I don't feel bad about saying it when I say it. And then there's the N word with the capital N dash word. And that is the same as the slur to me. So when people write the N word on the news or whatever, they mean the slur, <laughs> right? So you wouldn't have to bleep it or blank it out unless you meant this other word, right? So when you say the N word, you mean this other word and not this word that means friend or person or member of my community. So that's how I feel about that. <laughs> and then, and again, like the reason why I think they're different is because they have different histories. So that's like a whole nother conversation about it's reclamation. A, it's a whole record. I was going to say, yeah, uh, I have this conversation every semester, uh, every semester. But it's a great and word. Probably one of my favorite words. <laughs> and the, the issue of reclamation For this reason. is is a whole other conversation, the issue of reclamation. Yeah. Uh, because then the question becomes rec reclamation of what? Yeah, I teach a class on profanity and we have an entire week on this word. Oh, is that right? Okay, <laughs> I, only do, I only do a class. Boy, we should get together. I got, I'll uh, send you some papers. <laughs> okay, yeah, please yeah. do, please do. Uh, because it's a contested area. Uh, yeah. and, and, and I think you rightly pointed out there are different streams of folks and depending upon their histories. Um, they have different feelings. And in the class, that's very reflective. So everybody's singing, um, you know, uh, four, white girl, four white girls are singing Lil Wayne and everyone else uh, with, the, with the windows uh, down until mm -hmm. you get next to a car with Black folks. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and then, you know, then what becomes a self-deleter. Uh, uh, self so, and so what does that mean in society? You know, all that stuff. You it's know. fascinating. It really is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the thing that gets me is when they say Karen, Karen is the new N word. Which and is? I'm like, Karen is the new oh, yeah, N word. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And well, I'm like, well, yeah. if it was, yeah. how could you write the word Karen? Right. <laughs> right. It bothers right. me so much. And I, I would probably take it further and say, I haven't seen any lynched Karens lately. But anyway. Oh, my gosh. Anyway. Yeah, that's a whole other thing. Sorry. Uh, Sorry. But yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that you are fascinating and I appreciate you. I appreciate this. Oh, I appreciate you all so much. Yeah. Thanks for uh, having so me. So I think we ought to arrange at some point uh, a return to uh, see what your findings have uh, have brought. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, you will probably be there. You'll probably be at the the, uh, the gates of heaven. And, uh, you know, we'll be, <laughs> we'll be calling you Doc uh, to be uh, very soon. But we, we wish, really wish you well. And thank you so much. It was uh, such a joyous day. I remember I was right outside in my driveway and I was listening. And when you came on and they said, she talks about sociolinguistics and racial linguistics. I'm like, what? Who is this woman? And so I, I wrote you and I said, I hope that she writes me back. And you sure did. Thank you, you so right much. And, thank uh, you all so much. Yeah, I thank you. Thank you for your being here. And I wish you the best. I wish you well. Um, this is an area that really doesn't get covered as much as it should, I think. And so I think you have a really bright future and I think you have a big job uh, because I think uh, in us knowing who we are and the things that we say and the way we express ourselves and communicate is vital 
and understanding the things that come out of our mouths um, and, and looking at it in a, um, in a, in a conscientious way. So uh, we're going to be looking to you. Uh, we'll be trusting you as our leader to, to, to know. And then I won't have to ever have my mouth washed out with soap again. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I'm just playing. Thank uh, so thank you so very much, Kelly E. Wright. Uh, thank you for being here. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Okay. Yeah. Take care, everyone. Have a wonderful Thanks. and good night. Thank you. Thanks so much. Take care, everyone. Bye.